Hello, and welcome to Special Risks in ETFs, the latest installment of the Index Universe webinar series. I'm Allison Jones, Director of Conferences for Index Universe, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm pleased to be joined on the call today by Joel Dixon, Senior Investment Analyst and Principal at Vanguard. First, though, we'll be starting with our own experts, Dave Noddick, Director of Research here at Index Universe, Matt Hogan, our President of ETF Analytics, and Paul Britt, one of our ETF analysts. This webinar differs from our popular Alpha Beta webinar series. Rather than focusing on how to invest in a particular class or type of ETF, we're taking a step back to look at the impact ETF's incredible growth has had in the capital markets and what special risks that you, as an investor, should consider when you approach the ETF market. The format today is very straightforward. Matt and the team will kick things off with a presentation covering special risks. We'll then bring in Joel for a question and answer session that's sure to be quite lively. As a participant in this webinar, you can enter questions for any of the panelists using the Q&A tool on the bottom right-hand side of your webinar screen. Please don't wait until the end to ask questions. Submit them as they occur to you. We're going to collate those questions submitted throughout the webinar and answer as many as we can at the end. With that, I'll hand it over to Matt. Matt? Thanks, Allison. You know, I'm really excited about this webinar and especially pleased to have Joel joining us today. Uh, ETFs have grown enormously in recent years, as you said. Investors have placed roughly $1 trillion of their hard-earned money in exchange-traded products, driven really by the desire to tap into the low-cost transparency and tax efficiency that ETFs offer. Investors trust ETFs, and generally, that trust has been rewarded. But there are no free lunches in life or in investing, and there are risks associated with ETFs. Just how lethal those risks are and how personal or systemic they might be has been a topic of intense debate lately, and it's one we have planned to address head-on today. The bad press and mounting concerns about ETFs have been precipitated in part by adverse trends in the markets themselves. Over the past few years, we've seen stocks move in the same direction more than ever. Wild swings in the Dow and S&P 500 now seem commonplace. Up 300, down 250, it's a rare day when the market doesn't move by more than 100 points. Investors are upset, and some are blaming these developments on ETFs, whose growth has coincided with the arrival of these trends. Reports from the Kauffman Foundation and others have hold ETFs responsible for this rise in correlations, as well as knock-on effects like impeding the ability of small-cap firms to raise equity in the capital markets. Leverage and inverse ETFs, funds that promise to deliver a positive or negative multiple of an index return, have attracted lots of bad press, too. Some articles say these funds drive end-of-day volatility, others that they harm investors and are too complex for the retail investing public. Meanwhile, derivative use in ETFs have come under scrutiny. The SEC has halted the review of any new funds using derivatives more than a year ago, and it's been sitting on any novel ETF applications pending its review ever since. In time being, the CFTC has imposed new position limits on commodities, in part out of concerns that ETFs are influencing commodity prices. There's panic about ETNs. The FSB in Europe has published papers linking ETFs and systemic risks. And last month, our own U.S. Senate held a hearing on ETFs and market structure. It's quite a turnabout for a product some consider a major step forward for retail investors. And today, we'll try to identify which of these arguments and concerns have a basis in fact, which are cause for concern, and which are based on common misperceptions. We'll also call out a few things that are just plain wrong. So to break down the facts from the myths, we're bucketing these myriad concerns into three discrete categories, and we'll hit each one in depth and in turn. The first one is personal. Are ETFs doing what they say they're going to do? We'll hit a few cases where investors might get some surprises if they're not careful. The second bucket is more direct. Are there risks that you, as an investor, could lose all or some of your money in an ETF blow-up overnight? And finally, we'll hit the topic that's been making the most headlines lately. Are ETFs a threat to modern capital markets? That is, 
Are they driving correlations, increasing volatility, pushing companies out of the markets, and endangering the global financial system as a whole? But let's start with this. Do ETFs deliver? The short answer to the question is simple. Generally, yes. If you think about it, the core promise of most ETFs is to deliver the return of an index to investors. Morgan Stanley produces a study each year that compares the returns of each ETF to the returns of its underlying index over the course of that year. It's not quite tracking error, although people call it that. Tracking error is actually a matter of one-day portfolio deviations, and this looks out over a year. We call it tracking difference. But regardless of the name, it's the return investors experience in ETFs compared to the returns of indexes themselves. And generally speaking, ETFs do very well. The top line of this chart shows the average tracking difference of ETFs in various areas of the market compared to their indexes. And while the headline numbers look large, you have to remember that these include expenses. Once you adjust for expense ratios, most tracking differences vanish close down to zero. That's not to say that all ETFs track perfectly. Some do and some don't, but generally they track very well. To put it in perspective, since 1993, the S&P 500 Spiders, the oldest ETF in the U.S., has returned 7.7% a year. The S&P 500 index has returned 7.83% a year, a difference of 13 basis points, including expenses, over a nearly 18-year stretch. If you scale back and look just at the past 10 years, the difference in return has been just 8 basis points, which is actually less than the fund's expense ratio. By contrast, the average actively managed mutual fund charged 95 basis points in fees last year. So you can see that generally ETFs do a great job. Do they perform perfectly all the time? Of course not. There are famous examples of ETFs with poor tracking, such as the 07 to 2010 run of the iShares EEM versus Vanguard's VWO in the emerging market space. In that case, two funds tracking the exact same index delivered returns that were widely apart. In this chart, we look just at 2010 returns, and there's a 2.3% gap between the two funds, even though they track the exact same index. But the truth is, there are tracking errors throughout the ETF system, not just in the famous examples. The Morgan Stanley report, for instance, calls out EWX, the S&P Emerging Markets Small Cap ETF, noting that it underperformed its benchmark in 2010, by nearly 4%. That performance has continued recently. EWX trailed its benchmark by more than 2% over the past year, and there are various reasons for this. For starters, if you had to pick one area of the market that would be difficult to track, that would give index managers headaches, emerging market small caps has to be it. These are among the most liquid, illiquid, difficult to access securities in the world, and that means that the frictionless indexes they track are really just fantasies for investors. But there's more going on than friction here. There's also management strategy. Now, sophisticated portfolio tracking analysis is beyond the information, informational access that most investors have. But you can perform a few basic checks before you buy an ETF to ensure you're going to get something like the tracking you want. One easy place to start is what, what, with what we call replication percentage, which is a simple comparison of the number of securities in an index and the number of securities in a fund that aims to track that index. Currently, for instance, EWX holds 820 of more than 1,800 securities in the underlying emerging market small cap index. You have the largest risk of tracking error where the difference between the number of a securities a fund holds and the number of securities in the index is the largest. That generally happens in the liquid markets like emerging markets or fixed income. But you can also look, if information is available, at whether the portfolio accurately reflects the factor breakdowns of the relevant index. For instance, in 2010, Morgan Stanley said that EWX suffered because it tended to underweight the small securities and biased its country rates weights in the portfolio against markets that are difficult to access. It did that to ensure it had a liquid portfolio, but it led to tracking error. I'd argue that 200 basis points is not bad for such a difficult to access area of the market. Still, it's good to know what you're getting into. Of course, that kind of tracking error is really not the issue. It's critically important, and investors would do well to ask hard questions about tracking performance, but even in the worst case scenario, it's not gonna cost you more than a few percent a year.
The terrible headlines and true risk in ETF performance come from what we call expectations error, which is the difference between what you think you are getting and what you're actually going to get. The biggest source of expectations error in the market surrounds leverage and inverse funds and really has to do with what's called the daily reset process. It lies at the heart of investors' experience with these products and at the heart of a lot of bad press they receive. We saw a recent column by Howard Gold that called geared funds, quote, the single worst product for individual investors I've seen in two decades of covering the markets. That's hyperbole, but underlying there's a, there's a valid point. Most levered and inverse funds work one day at a time. The daily reset process means that a double long fund won't deliver double the underlying index results for a year, a month, or even a week, just one day. In volatile markets in particular, the way these portfolios rebalance each day, essentially adding exposure on days the market goes up and selling exposure on days the market goes down, creates a drag on returns that can significantly erode investments over time. Geared funds are not buy and hold products. This chart shows that difference better than most. It compares the return of three products, the Direction 3X Financials ETF, FAS, in dark purple, its negative 3X counterpart in green, and the straight 1X index they both are linked to in light purple. You can see that in 2010, the underlying Russell Financial Index posted a nice, almost 12% return. You might have expected the 3X fund to post a return in the mid-30s, but due to the one-day reset, it delivered just 13%, barely eat beating its 1X counterpart. Meanwhile, the negative 3X fund delivered not th negative 36%, as you might expect, but negative 51%, significantly worse. The moral here is clear. Don't hold geared ETFs for long periods of time in volatile markets. And the math on this is brutally simple. I've walked through the math on this slide 50 times in the past few years, and everyone gets it immediately. Moreover, fund fact sheets and prospectus documents clearly state all the risks. And firms like Direction and ProShares do a great job of providing tools that explain how these funds perform in different scenarios. But there's still a thorny question here. Does the full disclosure of the dangers associated with geared funds make them okay for the investing public, especially in retail brokerage accounts, when they, or at least make it okay for them to have super easy access? There's an argument that the correct answer here might be no. Retail investors can't open a margin or options account without certifying some level of sophistication. Some type of gate or entry bar might make sense for these products. Just having retail investors sign a mandatory risk acknowledgement form before they trade could be one step. Maybe it's not necessary, but maybe it's worth considering. We'll return to the question of leverage and inverse ETFs and whether they do more harm than good in a minute, but we should say that expectations error crops up in other sophisticated markets as well. In commodities, for instance, many people buying ETFs that access commodity futures have expressed frustration at their inability to deliver on spot returns. This chart, for instance, compares the returns of spot natural gas and the most popular natural gas ETF since 2009. Over that time period, spot gas is up 17.2%, which is pretty good. But investors in UNG are down 58%, which is less good by far. That difference is solely due to contango, the situation where out-month futures contracts are more expensive than near-month contracts, forcing investors to essentially buy low and sell buy high and sell low. Commodities markets aren't all in contango. They regularly fluctuate from contango to backwardation and back, and the fund here has done exactly what it says it does, which is provide exposure to front month natural gas futures. And yet, if you don't understand what you're buying into, you run the risk of not getting the returns you expect. Should there be a gate for futures-based commodity investment? That's another suggestion that's out there. Now, most of the time, the risks in your ETF are easy to understand because they're fairly transparent vehicles. If you pull up the web page for most ETFs, you'll actually see what that fund held yesterday, but not always. Some ETF fund issuers only show their holdings quarterly, some only monthly, and more importantly, very few ETFs do a good job of showing you the counterparties of the swaps that they hold, if they do hold swaps. Further, as much as most ETFs track very well and are reasonably cheap, some ETFs have gotchas if you don't read carefully. Just a few weeks ago, we noticed a new series of inverse volatility ETNs from UBS, which, if you added up all the fees, charged almost 4.5% a year. 
There's no guarantee your ETF is going to be cheap, and it clearly pays to read the prospectus. The last area where investors are occasionally tripped up is tax efficiency. Now, generally, ETFs are the most tax efficient and tax fair investment vehicle on the market today. For instance, in 2011, iShares just announced it would pay capital gains distributions on just two of its 233 ETFs, a remarkable feat that would be the envy of any major mutual fund operation. Rarely, but occasionally, you do see a large payout. In 2008, for instance, some unlucky Rydex inverse ETF paid out a shocking 86% of its NAV in capital gains. That, however, is really the exception that proves the rule. ETFs generally are as or more tax efficient than mutual funds in almost every case. Thanks, Matt. I'll take it from here. Um, so now that we've covered some of that first question, you know, do ETFs really deliver on their promise, it's time to dig into the second, which is whether the ETF itself can hurt you. Um, by this, of course, I don't mean whether or not you're going to lose money in an ETF. You can obviously lose money in any investment, but whether or not you're going to lose a lot of money, whether you're going to have real overnight risk. What we're referring to here is what's colloquially known as blow-up risk, um, but really what people mean by that is counterparty risk. Counterparty risk from ETFs is real, but perhaps not as real as uh, everybody thinks it is. Here are a couple of the major sources of counterparty risk, really in descending order of importance. ETNs or exchange-traded notes have really clear and well-understood counterparty risk. They're just debt secured by uh, an underwriting bank's promise to pay. It's just like any bond that they might float. And if that bank fails, ETN holders just stand in line with everybody else. When Lehman failed, it took down two of its ETNs, and any investors that were left holding to the bitter end lost all of their money. The theoretical counterparty risk here is 100%. You could actually lose all your money. But just because the fund is an ETF, not an ETN, it's not really a free pass either. Some ETFs, um, typically the geared ETFs Matt was talking about and some of the commodity products, get some or all of their exposure from over-the-counter swaps. And these are really bilateral agreements, just one-to-one. -one. Two parties agree to exchange a pattern of returns. And you can find out whether your fund holds these by looking at the word swap in the portfolio on its website. Um, and it sounds like product holding swaps take on complete counterparty risk, but that's not really true either. Typically, when two parties enter into a swap, the fund company and maybe a large bank, they don't actually exchange any money. They just sign a contract. And the only risk is any market movements that happen between uh, a mark to market. Now, that mark to market can happen as frequently as every night. And what would happen is if one person is up on the trade and one person is down, they simply wire money back and forth between each other to true up. So the only real risk you have is this value of change between these mark-to-markets. And if you're really worried, you can ask your ETF provider um, about how often they've settled those contracts. They might tell you they may not. Unfortunately, it's, uh, it's not particularly well-disclosed information, nor will they necessarily tell you who those swap counterparties are. Um, there are also funds that invest in listed derivatives. They might hold options and futures. There's really de minimis uh, counterparty risk here. They can certainly be risky instruments, right? A lot of times they involve leverage, but they're generally fully collateralized, uh, and the exchange is actually the counterparty there. So unless you actually believe that the, the futures exchange itself is somehow going to disappear, there's not much risk there. The last area is securities lending. Um, securities lending is really pretty straightforward. If you're a, a fund manager and you're sitting on, say, the S&P 500, you can earn a little bit of extra money by loaning those shares out to short sellers in exchange for collateral. Um, the risk there is pretty minimal because if the counterparty there, the person who borrowed your shares, goes bankrupt, skips down, somehow doesn't ever re-deliver you those shares, you have collateral generally in excess of what they borrowed, 102%, sometimes 104%. So again, your risk there is, is quite, quite de minimis and definitely not blow up risk. So generally speaking, to frame the bigger issue, we see it a bit like this. Um, with ETNs putting the whole value of the portfolio at risk on the right-hand side, while the other measures of counterparty risk are really quite soft, where things are generally soft and fluffy. ETNs are a little bit more like the Tasmanian devil on the right end of the spectrum. They're fine, but when they're not fine, you really have to watch out. And even for those ETNs, we think people generally overstate the real counterparty risk here. Um, because these products have intraday liquidity and because the shares can be redeemed back to the issuer on a daily or sometimes every other day basis, um, your real risk of getting stuck with an ETN 
uh, that's going to go bankrupt is quite low. Anybody who's paying attention knew that Lehman was in trouble for weeks prior to its bankruptcy, and it was relatively easy to get out. You might have paid a wider spread. It might have cost you a few percent, but there was certainly no reason you had to hold on to the bitter end. It wasn't an entirely illiquid vehicle. Um, and generally speaking, ETNs haven't traded to huge discounts when their banks are in trouble. So how do you know when to step aside? Well, what we tend to look at is the, is the credit default swap market. I mean, this is essentially the market for how risky these individual issuers are. This snapshot is from last week, and it shows that there's quite a broad range here, ranging from Morgan Stanley with 4.5% uh, uh, to insure a million dollars, um, all the way down to just basis points for place, places like HSBC or the Swedish export credit company. Um, when, when balanced against the advantages that ETNs can carry in certain situations, we think this is generally a pretty reasonable level of risk, but you can monitor CDS rates to see whether or not an issuer is particularly headed into trouble. Um, it's worth pointing out that you can't look at those, e those CDS rates and just say that's how likely they are to default because there's all sorts of issues there in terms of uh, repay rates, et cetera. So the real thing that investors are worried about really isn't the counterparty risk so much. It's, it's about these blowups uh, from things like short interest. Before we dive into the mechanics of short interest, let's just sort of get a sense of the landscape. Short interest in ETFs is highly concentrated in a relatively small number of ETFs. While short interest in stocks overall, say in the Russell 3000, um, is, is much more evenly dispersed. So this table looks... Um, this table shows the ETFs that have larger short positions than the Russell 3000 by a percentage of total market cap. But when you look at the median short value, it's actually lower. That means that the, if you look down the middle of the whole Russell 3000, um, you're, you're looking at much more common shorting, if you will, across them. The point here is simply this. The source of concern, significant short interest, is really confined to a handful of ETFs. But on paper, there's really only one thing that jumps off this table, and that's that 475 in the lower left-hand corner. Let's dig into how that's possible. That 475 would be uh, the somewhat infamous S&P uh, uh, Retail Fund, XRT. XRT short positions have frequently, in fact, almost constantly exceeded their total float. So how can this be true? Well, the first thing to point out is that the actual shares outstanding in XRT are wildly volatile. There's tons of creation and redemption activity in this fund. And this really isn't a problem because that's how these things are supposed to work, and the underlying shares are quite liquid. So it's actually quite easy for the authorized participants to make and redeem these shares on a constant basis. So it's this ratio um, between these numbers that's what we're looking at. And it's important to point out that the shares outstanding number is a self-reported number that's often laggy, it's often buggy, um, and so this ratio can be quite uh, inaccurate. Um, however, there is something probably going on here, and that's serial shorting, which we'll dig into. Serial shorting is what really drives people crazy. Um, a research firm called Bogan Associates raised a stink about this last year when they suggested that a highly shorted ETF like XRT um, could blow up. And their theory went a bit like this. If there was 400% short, what if all the people who bought those shares from the short sellers decided to redeem all at once? The ETF would have to pay everybody out. There wouldn't be enough, uh, there wouldn't be enough shares to give everybody all the stock that they thought they owned, and poof, it would collapse and there would be nothing left. And if that sounds a little bit silly, it is. So let's walk through what actually happens. So in the upper left here, first, someone buys the ETF. And they decide they want to make a little extra money, so they lend it to a short seller, borrower number one over here. Um, and then they, prov they provide the lender, buyer number one, with the collateral, generally 102%. Those particular shares are now 100% short. They got, went from buyer one, got borrowed by borrower one, sold to buyer two. They're 100% short. But the next person who bought those shares, buyer two, wants to do the same thing as buyer one did. He wants to earn a little extra money loaning this out. So he does the exact same thing. He lends it to borrower two, who puts 102% collateral back, and whammo, it's 200% short. And this can go on ad infinitum, essentially. No one's done anything wrong. Nothing untoward has happened. The second person to buy it isn't even aware that they're placed in a chain of events here. 
Where Bogan slips is that assuming that these multiple people all have claims on these shares in order to redeem them, when in fact only the person at the end of the chain has what's called fully settled shares. Right? They're, they are not encumbered by anything. And the issuer won't redeem somebody's shares unless they come to them completely un unencumbered. ETF issuers know this. They keep track of it. Um, and so the actual risk here uh, is quite minimal. So it can't cause a systemic collapse. Now, it does mean that you could have a huge short covering rally. If all of a sudden everybody wanted to get out of their shorts, if everybody did want to redeem, there would have to be a rash of creation activity. That creation activity means people would have to buy a lot of the underlying stock, and that could cause the shares of XRT or any fund in this situation to rock it up. However, that's exactly what happens when any individual security is heavily shorted. If the mood changes and everybody all of a sudden wants to not be shorted, but to be neutral or to be long it, that causes pops. With that, I think I'll hand it over to Paul to wrap us up. Thanks, Dave. Uh, now that we've covered the true and false risks uh, to individual shareholders, let's talk about the biggie. Do ETFs pose a risk to markets as a whole? Many of these concerns fall into two related themes. First, do ETFs drive the prices of the underlying securities rather than the other way around? And second, do ETFs cause the problems in capital markets or do they simply mirror a reality shaped by other forces? The first topic falls under the wag the dog theme. Three years after the fall 2008 financial crisis, correlations remain high. The table shows correlations between the S&P 500 stocks and the S&P 500 itself. Today's average and median correlations shown in the far right column are much higher compared to 10 and 20 years ago. Higher correlations are blamed on ETFs, and we agree up to a point. ETFs and other index products drive correlations up because the baskets of stocks that they tra hold trade as a block. Uh, the fund exerts buy or sell pressure on the whole basket. One of the drivers of this effect is the percentage of a firm's float that the ETF holds. It's easy to picture this in the context of a single country emerging market fund where the scale of local firms in the fund can be small relative to the outside uh, money flowing in. Single country EM funds are often concentrated, uh, say 50 to 75 stocks. So the fund's dollars are, are heavily concentrated in the stocks that they hold. The table shows an example. It's the bottom five holdings for the iShares Brazil ETF, EWZ, a uh, fund that with over $10 billion in assets. We're looking at the smallest holdings in the fund because of it's cap-weighted. So the firms at the bottom are the smallest. Small firms might be more susceptible to a fund owning a large chunk of the stock shares. The column at right shows that EWZ holds about 2% of the free float for these stocks. Not a dominant position, though other index products doubtless attract these stocks too. Most funds are cap-weighted and almost all use liquidity screens. Both of these factors tend to drive the fund's stake in smaller firms down, as is the case in this example. Fund issue issuers also have an interest too. After all, the funds want their products to trade well. A fund's tradeability improves when APs can trade in and out of uh, basket stocks without affecting the underlying price, or the market price of the stocks, that is. Concentrations in a fund's underlying securities is probably greatest in the commodity space. Earlier this year, for example, the United States Natural Gas Fund, UNG, had more than 25% of the open interest in front month, front month natural gas contracts, contracts maxing out position limits on the exchange. Comparisons of equity and futures can be tricky, though. <clears throat> for one thing, the supply of contracts is elastic compared to the number of shares. More, more contracts can be created if there's enough demand. But these are really exceptions, not the rules. ETFs are overall dwarfed by the total dollars that track indexes. The market cap of the S&P 500 is about, one, uh, is about 11 trillion. Standard & Poor's estimates that the $1.1 trillion are indexed to the S&P 500, or about 10% of its total value of the index. Of this, only uh, $126 billion is in ETFs, about 1%. So the impact of ETFs is part of a larger index effect that has more significant role on price discovery. Mutual funds trade baskets of securities every day, too. Uh, whether, in, whether in an ETF or a mutual funds, the baskets of, of securities don't trade in a vacuum. Risk on, risk off trading behavior continues in the aftermath of the financial crisis.
investors move in and out of cash, not on fundamentals, but on major macro events. And we've had no shortage of these lately. The Japanese tsunami, downgrade of U.S. Treasuries, and the European debt crisis leap to mind. For better or worse, index products make it uh, the risk-on, risk-off behavior easier and, a good, and also drive a good portion of uh, higher correlations. That said, however, uh, ETFs uh, are uh, small in AUM but, but can be quite large when it, um, when it comes to driving um, correlations, with, and that comes from daily trading. Uh, daily trading tends to be what sets the price. Uh, ETFs typically make up 25 to 35 percent of all trading activity on any given day, as this chart shows. I should point out, though, that this is overstated by about 25 percent, since ETFs include funds tracking things other than stocks, commodities, bonds, currencies, etc. These non-equity uh, products account for about a quarter of all ETF trading. Still, the, the equity-only equity only ETF trading uh, volume is significant. To be clear, the chart shows the trading of ETFs, not the, their constituent stocks. But the basket of stocks that underlie these ETFs are bought and sold whenever APs create or redeem, redeem to meet demand or to arbitrage. It's the buying and selling of the underlying baskets that drives correlations up. The point is that daily trading activity sets prices. Even if the ETF drives trading in a small percent of a firm's float, it can set the price if the rest of the float isn't trading much. ETF's modest footprint from an asset standpoint understates their market impact. So what else has an impact? A 2010 JP Morgan report cited high-frequency trading as a major source of high correlations in markets. High-frequency trading has become more and more prevalent in recent years, accounting for more than half of all trading volume uh, in 2008, 2009, and 2010. Two strategies used by high-frequency trading algorithms reinforce correlations. First, index arbitrage programs equalize disparities between index products and their underlying stocks. Correlations go up as programs buy and sell baskets, arbitraging away price differences. The process serves to transfer the impact of trading in index features and ETFs to the underlying stocks. The report notes, however, that uh, arbitrage and index futures rather than an ETFs dominate the volume associated with this strategy. Secondly, HFT strategies focusing on best execution break up very large orders in single name stocks into smaller chunks to reduce their impact on price. The net effect is to drive the volatility in the price of the individual stocks down, which increases the realized co-movement with the market. This is net net a positive for investors and a positive for the market, but it's worth uh, worth noting how the how the whole process works. There is one bright spot here that's often overlooked when the conversation turns to correlation, and that's this: correlation across asset classes are not rising. The chart of correlations between the Russell 3000 and the Barclays Aggregate Bond Index doesn't show any any clear trend at all. And the story is much the same for equities and gold, another classic diversifier. So the good news is, is that investors can still access the diversification at the asset class level, if not at the individual security level. Turning the page, people have uh, increasingly blamed ETFs not only for rising correlations, but also for rising volatility. A recent article in the New York Times by Andrew Ross Sorkin laid out a simple present premise. He said that levered and inverse funds are to blame for recent intraday volatility. This is a serious accusation that bears serious scrutiny. As mentioned, levered and inverse funds are designed to deliver a positive or negative multiple of an index's daily returns. The funds must reset their position at the end of each day, depending on the movement of the reference index. Sorkin contends that this daily true-up drives huge end-of-day price swings. We've done a fair amount of research on this uh, point, and we just don't see a link. First, geared ETFs have tiny assets and net exposure relative to the market. As of September 30th, geared funds totaled $36.6 billion in assets under management, and net exposures for the funds was a uh, short $13.9 billion. These figures are less than 10 basis points of the $51.6 trillion in total global, global market uh, capitalization. So clearly assets alone are not driving volatility. But the data get more interesting and more conclusive than that. 
the geared rebalance in all leveraged and inverse ETFs is pro-cyclical. This is counterintuitive, but it's true. Both levered and inverse funds rebalance in the same direction on a daily basis. They buy on up days and sell on down days. The example in this, uh, in this table illustrates this point. The top two rows, uh, for those two top rows, the market is up 10%. Both the levered and inverse funds need to buy at the end of the day to get the exposure they need, as shown in the far right column. When the market's down, both levered and inverse funds need to sell. For a recent paper on this subject, we look at actual trading on a recent uh, major trading day to see if there could be any significant impact. Specifically, we looked at the trading that took place on S&P 500 trackers on September 21st, a day where the market fell by 3.1%. As you can see here in net, ETFs sold one billion uh, of exposure into the close. But is that a lot? The answer is not really. If you look at the value of all uh, S&P 500 securities traded in the last 10 minutes of the day on that day, it was nearly 20 billion. Uh, peel that back to include the last hour, the time period when most levered funds trade, and it was more like 35 billion. That the geared ETF rebalance was a small fraction of that. Here's the important slide. If the thesis that geared funds create volatility were true, the pro-cyclical rebalance means that we would see momentum carrying through the end of the day. On a down day, for example, the geared funds would rebalance uh, towards the end of the day by selling, driving prices further downward. The fact that both levered and inverse funds are pro-cyclical uh, pro would only magnify this effect. However, when we looked for this pattern in the actual data, we just didn't see it. We checked a variety of time periods at the end of the day, 15 minutes before close, 30 minutes, etc. What we saw was that the market was just as likely as not to reverse direction at the end of the day. It's your basic coin toss, in other words. A 2010 report by William Trainer at East Tennessee State University also looked hard at gear ETFs and, found, um, and volatility, but he also found no link. It's factually true that geared ETFs trade in the direction of the market uh, when they rebalance at the end of the day. And if there were 10 or uh, 20 times current assets invested uh, in levered ETFs, this would be a serious matter. But currently, at these levels, the data show pretty clearly that that's not, not having an impact. One last point on intraday volatility. Here, the ETFs get their exposure through swaps, not by uh, buying and uh, selling directly the underlying. Their end-of-day rebalance is done by tweaking the size of these contracts. The folks on the other side of the contract doubtless hedge their position in some way, but not necessarily within the 3 to 4 p.m. window. Trainers' study, though, found no evidence that the end-of-day rebalance drove volatility the following morning. Broken trades are another popular topic. Each month, the, SH, the SEC publishes its SHO list, which is the list of securities that they have experienced repeated fails to settle. They started doing this uh, following the naked short crisis a few years back and, uh, as a way to prevent rampant naked short selling of targeted securities. Recently, nearly every security on the SHO list has been an ETF. This has caused many people to cry out problem and the systemic risk. But there are two important things to remember here. Virtually no ETFs uh, trades fail. Any trade that enters into the DTCC system is guaranteed, and while we don't have data, the number of trades that actually are broken is estimated to be extraordinarily small. The truth, however, is that uh, there's a lot less here than meets the eye. The National Securities Clearing Corporation is the entity that clears trades and nets payments for market participants. This generally takes three days to do. The SEC fail to deliver list uses this T plus three yardsticks, which makes great sense for stocks. But the people who trade in large volumes of ETF shares, authorized participants, and market makers are allowed six days to settle per SEC rules. The SEC fails list is simply the wrong tool to measure broken ETF trades. ETF trades are delayed in operating per the regulations, not the other way around. When asked about this at last month's Senate hearing on ETFs, SEC Representative Eileen Rominger said that broken trades for all equities, including ETFs, actually decreased significantly over the period that they measured, down 76% from September 20, uh, 2009 to April 2011. Reasonable, peop 
reasonable people can differ as to whether this T plus six rules helps or hurts ETF investors. APs and market makers use this extra time to gather shares to reach creation unit thresholds, typically 50,000 shares. Doubtless, it makes the, their lives easier, and maybe it helps to keep spreads tighter for the rest of us. Arguing this point on either side, though, is quite different from saying e ETFs frequently fail to deliver and therefore aren't safe to trade. That's simply not the case. ETFs have also been blamed for another uh, uh, adverse capital market trend of the decline in small cap IPOs. A recent report from the Kauffman Foundation contends, without any evidence, that ETFs focus on, focusing on small cap U.S. equities scared away aspiring firms from raising capital in the public markets. They cite a 30% drop in the number of listed firms over, over the last 12 years, a period that also happened to see a huge growth in the number of ETFs. They contend that firms desiring to go public were afraid to do so because their stock price would be driven by movements in the small cap index rather than the fundamentals of the firm. So first off, yes, the IPO market is well off, uh, particularly the market for small cap IPOs. That market collapsed with the dot-com boom. Fortunately, the National Venture Capital Association just completed a study in October that was massive and extensive on the causes of this, uh, causes of this decline. It's an enormous definitive piece of work, but I think the chart pretty much shows it all. The biggest thing to change in the IPO space is simply the administrative burden. It now costs 2.5 million to go public and another 1.5 million to stay public, and that's for a small company. Couple that with the virtual elimination of boutique investment banks that drove the 1990s IPO boom, and it's easy to paint a picture here. And the NVCA isn't the only one saying this. Last month, the Jobs Council, led by GEO CEO, GE CEO Jeff Immelt, issued a report that directly addressed the decline in IPOs. The report makes no mention of ETFs, though. Instead, it cites regulatory bar barriers, such as Sarbanes-Oxley, and a lack of incentives, meaning tax breaks, for late-stage firms. In a recent Wall Street Journal piece by David Weald on small-cap IPOs cites an additional factor, the decline in analyst uh, coverage for small firms. No mention of ETFs here either. It's not like small, small companies aren't finding sources of late-stage liquidity. They're just doing it in the old-fashioned way by getting bought. Ever since the dot-com crash, small companies are vastly more likely to engage in merger or acquisition than to go out in IPO on their own. Thanks, Paul. And uh, before we wrap it up, I wanted to take a quick look on the horizon for all these risks. You know, on the regulatory front, just to review, the SEC review of derivatives and ETFs is ongoing. That means new filings for funds with derivatives are held up, although existing funds are not affected, and plain vanilla ETFs can go forward in the SEC process. The CFTC did, in fact, issue new position limit guidelines last month, but the impact on ETFs really remains to be seen. We saw iShares, in another approach, issue a kind of truth in labeling suggestion for exchange-traded products, breaking out that universe into ETFs, ETNs, ETCs, and ETIs. ETF, in iShares' view, uh, would apply to plain vanilla 1940 Act mutual funds. ETNs would, of course, be the notes. ETCs would apply to 33 Act funds that hold physical commodities. And ETI would be their slot bucket covering everything else. It's unclear whether this effort, which iShares brought up at the October Senate hearing, will gain any traction or if an alternate naming convention will move forward, but it's certainly something that's top of mind for a lot of people in the industry. You know, here in this presentation, we mentioned um, the idea of creating a speed bump in front of tactical products like levered and inverse funds or VIX-based products. Um, there are challenges here, such as where to draw the line. You know, would physical commodities be considered safe while futures-based commodities not? What about currency funds? What about emerging market debts that include currency exposure? There's opportunities for sure for increased transparency and clarification in areas like taxation and swap disclosure. So there's really a lot going on um, to clarify risks and to bring more information forward. And you know, those are, those are really some of the questions we wanted to ask of Joel Dixon, again, Senior Investment Analyst and Principal for the Vanguard. Uh, before I start off with Joel, I'll remind you guys, 
as participants in this webinar that you can ask questions of Dave, Paul, myself, or Joel using the Q&A window on your screen. To jump to one of those questions, usually around this time we get asked whether replays of the slides will be available. And the answer, of course, is yes. They'll be available at indexuniverse.com within a day or two of this presentation. Um, but without further ado, I wanted to bring in Joel and really start with the big one, Joel, which is, you know, what is your take on rising correlations and whether ETFs are essentially uh, the tail wagging the dog of the market today? Do you think there's any truth in that? Well, Matt, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, yeah, the, the correlation argument is obviously the, the latest and in some ways um, – uh, one that you know certainly has a plausible scenario to it, and and the way that I always like to think ab about plausible is it's another way of saying yes, but. And the but here is that we have been through a period of very high macroeconomic volatility. And whether it's financial crisis or it's recession or it's job numbers or it's the European debt crisis, the, uh, you know, the common risk factor that affects all equity securities has been very volatile. And that is the outlook on the economy and the financial markets. And, and it, you know, it, it seems like daily we're waxing and waning between fear and euphoria in, in some ways. Yes, things are going to get settled. No, they're not, and so forth. And in fact, if you look historically at the relationship between financial market volatility and macroeconomic volatility, where you take something like uh, a business conditions index that uh, the Philly Fed uh, publishes, for example, the volatility in that series very closely mirrors volatility in, in equity markets, and that is regardless of the period when ETFs were in play or even before the time that ETFs uh, even existed. So from, from you know, our standpoint, we just see this as a, a, a natural period of macroeconomic volatility, which is driving the sort of common risk factor associated with all uh, equity securities. And so, therefore, correlations between securities are going to be up and market volatility is going to be up. I think what sometimes we forget in this analysis is that if you look at the period from about 2003 to 2007, uh, after the, the burst of the, of the tech bubble. Um, it was a period of very low volatility uh, in the marketplace, and yet ETFs were growing tremendously, uh, especially on the U.S. equity side. They, are, you know, uh, they were quite large at that point in time, too, relative to, you know, on a percentage basis, relative to current metrics. So um, yeah, the, it, it, if one expected it being ETFs really driving the correlations, you would have seen a substantial increase uh, over the entire last decade uh, that would have been much more steady instead of a period of very low volatility followed by a period of somewhat normal volatility given the macroeconomic conditions we've been in. Is this the kind of thing that you're actually hearing from investors about? I mean, you're out there talking to advisors and institutions and even individual investors. What have they focused on? Is it just this kind of issue or are they asking other kinds of questions, things that we might have not even hit on today? Well, I, I, I think what, what we end up hearing about and having to discuss is really sort of, you know, the, the issue du jour in the, you know, <laughs> in the discussion of financial press. I mean, it's, you know, to the extent that, you know, you get silly season arguments like the small cap IPO issue or, or the shorting issue of, of whether an ETF can collapse, you know, you end up having to deal with that. Um, to the extent that, you know, there's more emphasis on correlations or, you know, I'm actually over in Europe right now and, uh, you know, there's the whole discussion of counterparty risk in the context of uh, synthetic versus physical ETFs. And, you know, everyone's trying to stake out a position and, and I think in some ways it's causing more confusion when people are setting out these extreme positions than, than it actually is in being helpful in, in pointing out what can be some issues. We do need to understand the ETF structure and if there are any side effects to it. But um, the way it's being done, I think, is just uh, more hyperbole than, than actual analysis. Joel, speaking of structure, what do you think about the, the notion that I shares floated out there about some kind of naming system? Do you think that will help? Um, do you think it would muddy the waters, and do you think it's, you know, how workable is an idea like that? Uh, you know, it's certainly an interesting concept, and, and, and you know, 
there's clearly some things that need to be done to help with investor understanding and um, education. I'm not so sure labeling in and of itself will do that. I, I think it has gotten to the point, however, where everyone's just hearing the term ETF and it's being used as a catch-all phrase for all of these different investment strategies and structures and tax issues. And people just hear ETF and, and it's getting to the point where people don't know what to think when they hear that term ETF. Um, you know, w with the labeling proposal that I've, that I've heard so far, I guess I, I worry that it could potentially cause more confusion, at least from the standpoint of, let's take the leveraged um, and inverse uh, portfolios as one example of this. Um, they actually are open-end mutual funds in terms of their legal structure. Many of them are. And in fact, ProShares has uh, standalone open-end mutual funds that aren't ETFs that have leveraged uh, uh, exposure. And, and so, you know, to me, if it's an ETF and people hear the word funds, you know, and it's an open-end fund, to carve out something that's an open-end fund and not calling it an ETF in some ways can just lead to even more confusion. What is, what isn't, and so forth. I think the issue, though, that has come up with all of the product innovation and expansion of ETFs over the course of the last several years has been the question, and you raised it in the, in the uh, presentation, about suitability and whether investor protections and, and sort of common strategies that have been used over time are actually maintaining their consistency in terms of disclosures and suitability for investors. And I'll just give a couple of quick examples on that. One is, you know, in an IRA, you really can't short an individual security. You know, it's, you, I mean, you can't really have a margin account in an IRA. But yet, you could go long an inverse ETF. Now, granted, the ETF is a limited liability issue and so forth, and so there, there are some differences. But ultimately, you're getting sort of the same economic exposure, but you can't do it in one form, but you can in another. Is that what we want? And the other one I would just say is the, the whole growth, um, especially on the partnership side and commodity futures uh, investments and so forth, uh, historically have been investments that generally were only available to high net worth in either you know, so-called qualified or affiliated investors you know, that had to go through extra hoops in order to, to access those, those investments, and now have been much more mass market through some of the ETF uh, structures. And a, again, I think there's a question of suitability there, and I, and I liken it to, um, you think about uh, medicines. You know, a lot of drugs uh, have previously been prescription that have gone over the counter. I almost think that's what we're seeing here with some of these ETF strategies is you used to have to have a prescription to have them. Now they're over the counter, and is that really the right approach given the risks that might be involved with those types of investments? But do you see the solution there being regulatory or industry? I mean, obviously, we can only have so many webinars, and we're not going to hit every investor. Um, and ETF issuers like yourselves can... Uh, you know, basically scream from the rooftops till they're blue in the face to do education. Um, would you be in support of, you know, we were talking earlier about some of these kinds of gates where, you know, perhaps these things are sort of reclassified based on what they hold. I mean, do you think that that's somewhat inevitable? Uh, I don't know about inevitable, but I certainly think that um, type of approach is worth a lot of discussion and possible implementation. I mean, you think about if you have a margin account or if you want to trade options on your own uh, a brokerage account, you have to actually sign specific documents saying you understand the risks involved in, in that sort of trading practice. Um, that is certainly something that needs to be considered uh, for you know, some of the ETF structures or investment approaches. It's not so much structure dependent as, as uh, uh, investment approach dependent. And you know, it's certainly something that, that things should be considered. Uh, I, I, I would hesitate, though, to say you know, to ban certain approaches or structures and so forth, because ultimately, yeah, while we've seen this institutionalization or this democratization of institutional trading strategies through the ETF structures in different forms, uh, it's not clear, you know, I mean, who's, who's to say, who's to be the czar of this process? You know, and, and you know, that this is good, but this one isn't. It's very, very hard to draw the line.
Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, Joe, you know, I wanted to ask a question about securities lending. You, we certainly see investors panic about securities lending activity by ETF companies um, during times of real crisis. I guess, you know, sort of what sort of risk guards are there in place um, at a firm like Vanguard in terms of how that securities lending activity happens and, and what sort of collateral is in place um, and, and what, what would give investors comfort or concern uh, about a firm's securities lending policy? Yeah, it, it, and you know, you got to it a little bit in the in the uh, presentation, in the in the idea of how the collateral is invested is an important consideration. Um, I, I actually think there are sort of three parts to a securities lending uh, process that that people need to understand. The first is what securities are actually being lent. Is it sort of volume lending? Uh, you know, where a lot of securities are being lent just trying to pick up sort of the pennies and the nickels, or is it so-called value lending where it's the securities that are on special that give you a lot more uh, income from the, from the lending there? Um, you know, so that, that's one aspect of it. What securities do you lend? The second then is how do you invest the collateral? And the collateral, you know, is especially in the in the US it's usually a hundred and two percent or more of uh, the the value outstanding hopefully it's it's uh, reset daily uh, and that's what we certainly uh, do it at, at Vanguard um, and you uh, it, it's high quality cash equivalent collateral and it, uh, you know the question is how do you invest it uh, some of the institutional funds that got into some trouble in 2008 had invested it a little bit more aggressively uh, in terms of credit quality of the paper, uh, the, the commercial paper, for example, or bank paper. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that the, the quality control around uh, or the, the safety, if you will, around the collateral uh, investment process is, is a key question to ask. And then the third, you know, I would say is, you know, that's good to know is, um, you know, what percentage of the securities lending revenue is, is given back to the investors. I mean, the investors are taking 100% of the risk. Um, and you know that's that's the issue with you know how much are how much are they getting back, um, and you know but by and large you know especially in the U S the the securities lending collateral is high quality cash equivalents conservatively invested very very little counterparty risk there even when something like um, Lehman uh, had some problems you know and, and at Vanguard we had some securities on loan uh, with. Uh, with Lehman, and we were able to buy them back in with the collateral very quickly uh, without a loss to the investors. Joel, here's a question from the audience. What, what kind of things should investors uh, be monitoring as far as these risks go? What, what should they be looking at to protect themselves? Uh, <laughs> I, I think... <laughs> Some of it depends on what the risk is. That's uh, you know, if, if it's silly season for some of these risk discussions, then you know, ignoring it's kind of the best best approach. But <laughs> but you know, the fact is, how do we know? Um, and and that's where um, I you know I, I think there is a role for education and again, whether it comes from the sponsors, whether it comes from you know folks like yourselves at Index Universe, um, to to really understand better the structure. Now that said, you know, in many ways. You know the, the the ETF and still the vast majority of exchange traded funds uh, in the U.S. at the end of the day are index funds. You know they're replicating or optimizing a basket of securities to an index physically held, um, and you know that type of investment approach has been tried and true in in the U.S. whether it's on the institutional side or on the retail side for more than thirty years at this point, and so you know. Uh, it's still important to do the due diligence. I mean, not every index manager is the same. You know, there can be differences in tracking and how you construct the portfolios with optimization or full replication. But ultimately, the structure at the end of the day of the vast majority of ETFs is well known. And, you know, the plain vanilla approach, uh, if, if you can get your head around that, uh, is, is uh, pretty, uh, a pretty well-worn territory. That's good, Dave. I actually wanted to ask you one question that we're getting from the audience related to a slide you presented, which was on the leverage and inverse um, rebalancing. You know, the, the, the question is, is twofold. First, are there people that can front run the sort of pro-cyclical trading um, in those leverage and inverse ETFs? Um, and second, 
you know, is the is the pattern of end of day volatility clearer if you focus on those days where there are significant market moves and therefore significant trading? Yeah, it, I wish it was cleaner, right? I mean, it would be nice if you could easily segment the data set and do that. We have looked at um, a lot of time series data looking at both end of day and opening volume, looking at it on up days, down days, uh, sort of you know average volume, low volume, high volume days. and. Uh, uh, the reality is almost no matter how you slice the data, you end up looking at these sort of 50-50 like outcomes on whether or not you get ramps into the close or pullbacks into the close, which is really what you're looking at. Um, the issue of front running um, implies that you believe that they're moving the market at a particular time. And, and it's important to understand that when we're talking about something like the big leveraged S&P 500 funds and inverse S&P 500 funds, they're not actually the ones in the market. They're negotiating a swap, right? They have a swap outstanding with a big bank, maybe Bank of New York or somebody like that. Bank of New York or the theoretical counterparty is the one that has to go into the market to actually get the underlying exposure so that their book is balanced at the end of the day. Now, they know pretty early, generally by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what that balance is going to be. They call the swap counterparty. They say, we're looking at about this much in creation or redemption activity, so our net swap is going to have to look like this at the end of the day. And they start putting on those trades for this whole period from about 3 o'clock in the afternoon all the way through the market on close auction. And so, for instance, in the S&P, you're looking at something like $70 billion trading hands there, of which on a big day, as we saw, about a billion might be from these leverage and inverse funds. Now, you know that that's a billion going in a certain direction, um, but if the odds are 50-50, trying to front run that doesn't seem like a particularly profitable way to make a, make a business. So I, I don't think it's, there's a lot of room there for people front running that. There might be in the commodity space, which we didn't talk about, right, when we have a huge fund like UNG, which everybody knows is going to have to roll its front month exposure, there have been people who've raised the concern that that's a very front-runnable trade. They have to trade within a certain window by prospectus. Um, and, and I think there are legitimate questions to be asked about the trading patterns going on in the commodities market, and that's just work that hasn't been done yet. And I, I have one last question for you, Joel, um, which actually just came in from the audience. And this is outside of Vanguard's purview, but I think interesting and perhaps forward-looking. Are there any risks specific to actively managed ETFs that stand out to you um, uh, separate from market risk? Or, or, or is the sort of core underlying structure and, and, and questions there about the same? Well, Matt, you're going to get me a little bit on my soapbox on, on active ETFs. I think we crossed the Rubicon on active ETFs a long time ago because um, of the, the hurdles to get, especially on the equity side, active ETFs sort of through the approval exemption process uh, you know, at, the, at the SEC. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what has happened now is you've seen this proliferation of index creation by index providers, and some of that, frankly, is, is uh, you know, money managers coming up with back-tested strategies, creating new indexes that they can then track with, uh, you know, with ETF investments uh, or, or issue, uh, you know, sponsor ETFs. So uh, I, I think some of these, and, you know, people call them different things, uh, like strategy indexes, uh, reflect really some actively managed strategies that are out there that, and uh, I, I, I think there's a bit of a battle for the definition or the soul of indexing, uh, you know, concept that's going on because of uh, some confusion that's being created over active versus index through the creation of these indexes. Now, that said, in terms of active indexes uh, and risks, uh, to me, what you know, when we think about you know active uh, approaches, there's certainly the questions about whether front-running risk is an issue there to the extent that uh, portfolio transparency may lead to some sort of knowledge or the ability to sort of guess where where certain uh, positions might be, especially as those grow. I think there are a couple of other risks though that are actually probably even a little bit uh, more uh, a little bit greater than that. One, one is you know how just some idea, and we don't know until we get a lot of active uh, funds, and especially with uh, some size and, and diversification in them. Um, you know how will the arbitrage mechanism work with the the AP creation redemption uh, relationship, and will it work roughly the same way as it does with um, 
with uh, you know the the traditional ETFs as we've come to know them. We think it probably will, but it is a bit of a question just to ask you know, with the structure and so forth. Will that will that occur? And then the final one I would say is is sort of what's the end game on active ETFs? I think there's the potential that certain active strategies could be victims of their own success. And that, and by that I mean, you know, when uh, you know when we look at active strategies, there's a point at which the ability to manage that strategy may be compromised by the size of the asset pool that you're managing. You know, see this in small cap uh, portfolios all the time. And in that case, how do you restrict the ETF so that it doesn't grow too large to sort of, uh, you know? wipe away all of the supposed advantage that you're going to get through the active process. Um, and, and, you know, closing an ETF uh, is a very difficult proposition to think about. Not that it can't be done, it's just you run the risk that it turns into a closed-end fund pretty quickly. Uh, you know, not unlike what you saw, for example, with uh, Market Vector's, you know, your, uh, Egypt fund, you know, earlier this year, where all of a sudden you're going to get you know, the potential for huge discounts or premiums depending on sort of supply and demand because now your outstanding shares are not open-ended as they typically are with, a, with an ETF structure. That's a great answer. Um, unfortunately, I think we're, we're about five or ten minutes over time, so I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Joel, thank you very much for joining us all the way from London. Really appreciate it. Uh, oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, for more information, you can hit indexuniverse.com or vanguard.com. Uh, we got, had a lot of questions we weren't able to get to, and we ran as long as we could. Um, information on CE credits will be emailed to live participants, and slides and a replay of this uh, webinar will be available within the next few days at indexuniverse.com. We hope you'll join us again for this or one of our Alpha Beta Series webinars in the future. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.